maybe one parent feels really strongly about like, we don't do screens at the table or there's a time limit in the day. Well, then let that parent enforce that. That's actually not bad. And it's not saying that the way the other parent is doing it is wrong. It's just, hey, this happens to be important to me. So I'll put those systems in place and and help make sure they happen. Now that has to go the other way though, too. So what it means is if the other parent doesn't have the bandwidth for that, that's fine. They don't have to implement those things, but they do need to support them if you've put them in place. Welcome to Raising Adults, the groundbreaking parenting podcast that starts with the end in mind. We're your co-hosts, Dina Thayer and Kira Dorian. We created future-focused parenting to take families from surviving to thriving. So join us as we help you stop raising kids and start raising adults. Well, hello, future focused parents. Welcome to another episode of Raising Adults podcast. I'm over here in my closet. Kira's over there in her laundry room. And we're going to talk today about a listener question that we received that is a really good one. But before we dive into that, I just want to say hello across the miles and across the airwaves to Kira. How are you today? I'm hanging in there. How are you? <laughs> That was a good, honest, authentic answer. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. We have our first like kid at home needing a COVID test because school requires it. It's just all a little bit upside down, but that's okay. I was expecting it to be, I was expecting this to happen and set the bar really low <laughs> for, for what this year was going to look like. So it's, it's, it's fine. It's all going to yeah. be fine. Because you were totally expecting this and then it happened. So it's not a shock, at least. Exactly. Exactly. How are you? Fun. You know, I'm well. I'm on the precipice of my youngest human turning 18. So it's really weird. I have to say, this is so different when it's your baby. And so many of you still out there still have youngers. And I know you're already experiencing, oh my goodness, it goes so fast. Yeah, it really does. (laughs) So I'm well. I'm well, but I'm. It's it. Yeah. I'm, I have a lot of feels this year. What can I say? Yeah. That makes sense to me. Oh my gosh. 18. That sounds terrible. <laughs> like yeah, I don't recommend it. terrible at the same time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's so gratifying. And he's so excited because we always on their birthday, take them to, you know, we register them to vote and then they get to get me off their bank account, which I've said, mentioned on the show before. So, I mean, there's some excitement, right. The, some fun stuff about not having mom be able to tell what you're doing with your money, but actually he's great with his money. So I don't really look at it. That's awesome. Um, We've had some other, yeah, we've had some other children, not so much. We're like, what's with the excess transaction fees? Okay. No, but so I think, I think it's really positive and it's great seeing how ready he is to step into that. I'm not as ready to step into that. (laughs) So So there you go. And um, we are in November. So I'm just going to quickly share the November thing of the thing. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm kind of over this year. I was saying to Kira, even before we started, I'm like, I'm so glad there's only a few of these left. I'll never do it this way again, but November resolution is, and by the way, October wasn't as awful as I thought getting up early on the weekends. I didn't love it, but it, it wasn't awful. Okay. Uh, So, you know, it is what it is. I love the going to bed at a set time. Didn't as much love the getting up, but it wasn't terrible. Now for November, you guys haven't heard this yet, but we have a guest coming up who shared something that was kind of revolutionary for me in the interview. And that was that she, she phrased self-care so differently. She called it putting herself on the calendar. And so I decided that would be a really great thing to try. And so for November, I'm going to put myself on the calendar 30 minutes a day of an activity I enjoy, whether it's, even if it's just watching a show, I'm not saying it's going to always be this elaborate, like I took myself to happy hour, but (laughs) 30 minutes a day, I'm putting myself on the calendar and see how it goes. Awesome. Oh, I love that. You'll have to let us know in December how that went. Yeah. I, I, I think I'll like it. I think what will be interesting is making it a habit, right? Where it's really daily. I think we almost view self-care as like a treat once in a while. So for me, it's going to flip that on its head and say, no, like it's important enough that you do it all the time. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. So here is the question we got and it, and it was admittedly, it was a good one because we talk a lot on the show about parental unity, but we hadn't gone at this exact angle. So we're going to, we're going to do our best today. And the question was, what do you do if you are in a parenting team and that other person either isn't just isn't 
future focused or doesn't want to be like, Mm -hmm. maybe you're all on the bus for FFP and your partner's like, I'm not that into that model. And we've been really real on the show here, Kira and I, that we get it, that this style of parenting isn't for everyone. And, and we own that because we are for the people who want to do it this way and want to be intentional and want to be proactive and use those tools. And we get it. That isn't everybody. Well, what if, what if you're partnered with that person who isn't everybody, (laughs) right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that today and hopefully be helpful. Yes. Yes, we are. It's a great question because, you know, at the end of the day, if if you share a child or children, everyone's opinion does matter. (laughs) even if we disagree. (laughs) Right. So it is important that, you know, everybody feels seen and heard, but that also that we feel satisfied with the job that we're doing as parents. And so this is a complicated topic. I agree. I think that was really well said that everyone's voice in the parenting team matters. So there has to be some respect for that. So then what do you do? Maybe you feel really strongly about an intentional approach. And if your partner doesn't, how do you how do you mitigate that? And so I think one of the things that I would say is, first of all, you do need to be well-versed in what it takes to get on the same page on things. So even if that means you come a little bit off some of the really super rigid, if you're a real planner, maybe you need to step away from that a little bit. Maybe they need to come a little bit toward that, but you first have to have the foundation of knowing the tools for getting on the same page. And so I would really recommend our episode on that parenting on the same page, because parental unity is something that will rear its head over and over in the life cycle of a relationship where you're just not seeing something eye to eye and you need to have the tools to get on the same page about it. Even if it's going to look like a mishmash of your two styles. So I would really suggest that because you need those foundational tools first. Um, And I can just quickly revisit a few of them. One is the importance of communication can't be overstated. Make sure you've got scheduled time in your lives that you guys touch base and that you talk about what are the things cropping up in your parenting journey so that you already have the communications line lines open. It's way harder to get on the same page if you're like, we don't even ever talk about this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So getting getting that talking as an established facet of the relationship is going to be huge. And then another one that I think is really key that is just worth a quick highlight is whenever you can just back your person. So they may say something once in a while to, to the children that you're like, wow, I would not have done that. But when you can, especially in front of the kids, back them, support that decision, show that you're a united front. That's going to go a long way, especially if as a result of maybe a parenting mismatch, like we're talking about today, especially if you're about to maybe change some things and do some things different in your house with the kids. I think if they can see, you know what, they have each other's back. It really makes a huge difference. I mean, you might have more you'd like to add there, but I think those are those are two I would want to at least highlight as a foundational piece. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I actually think I love that you brought this up because I think that this is sort of the thing I would say about this topic is don't think that just because you don't agree on how to parent that you can't get on the same page. I actually think you can. If you're communicating well, you're clear on your family's values, and you're really trying to seek to understand each other, you can get on the same page and agree on how you're going to be parenting differently. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? The point is that you agree on it, that you have a plan, that you've come to the table together to discuss it, not that one parent's over here parenting this way and the other one's over here parenting that way and no one's talking about why it looks different. So I actually think that is the key, no matter how this is going to look. And I guess the piece that I would add is the seeking to understand, because I think a lot of us lean toward a certain parenting style because of something deep inside of us, often from our childhoods. And so really looking at your partner and going, okay, it comes back to the why, right? Why do you feel more comfortable parenting that way? Why is that important to you? Your partner might have a great why. 
that you didn't think about that might not change your why or how you want to parent, but might help you really understand what's making them uncomfortable with this future focused model, because there might be something really deep there. And if you can figure that out, you're much more likely to find a middle ground. You're much more likely to understand what you're seeing when they're doing what they're doing instead of getting all frustrated that they're throwing your future focused parenting model out the window. Does that make sense? Oh, I'm so glad you said this because as a divorced person, I have had to do exactly that. And I just love that you challenged the assumption that because we disagree, we can't get on the same page. Sometimes it's about getting on the same page in doing it differently. Yeah, and that you don't agree. We both yeah, agree we don't agree. <laughs> absolutely. And I can definitely say in a two household situation, that has been the case a lot for us, but it's not only for that. You can be in an intact family and still have to say, you know what? I, I'm not going to do it that way. Here's why. Uh, you're welcome to do it that way. And I think where it matters that you get matching is in things that really impact the kids in terms of it might be confusing to them. So things like discipline should probably be very similar. Mm -hmm. Things like morning and evening routines should be very similar. But things like how many times a week we get dessert, they don't have to match. Mm -hmm. And it can be okay that kids, because guess what? Kids do this anyway, that kids might see one parent as a little more fun and mm -hmm. one as a little more not. That's me, in case you're wondering. I'm the yeah, not me fun. Me too. Oh my gosh, totally not the fun parent. 100% I'm not the ice cream parent. Okay, I can admit it. But, but, I, but that can be okay and even healthy because they also then grow up learning what their parents' strengths are. Mm -hmm. You know what? If I want some consistency, if I want some sound advice, maybe I'm going to go over here to mom. That often happens in our house. If I just need to vent and then maybe go talk about it over a burger, I'm calling my dad. <laughs> like this, this is, oh, and that is okay. And I think what you've, that's why what you've said is powerful because I think we kind of want to start with the idea that, well, it's somehow fundamentally not okay. And it's just not the case. So I love that you said that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and I also think there's a piece here of, you know, agreeing that you both want to parent well, because it's not like the other parent is like, I want to be a shitty parent, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I'm doing this because I want to be a terrible parent. Like that's not what's going on. Everybody's trying to do the best that they can. And so I think it's important to be looking at that and looking at, all right, well, what's working? Like take the sting out of, our passion to do right and our passion to be the best parent we can be. Can we at least start by talking about what, what have we seen that actually works? Right. And if, if what you're doing is working, that's a great thing to present. Like I, I, I understand that you want to parent that way. Here's what I see when you do that. Here's what I see when we do it this way, this feels like it works better. What do you think? <laughs> right. To allow yeah. the conversation to not be about wants, to not be not be personal, but really down to brass tacks of like what works and what doesn't work in your family and, and look mm -hmm. coming together around making things work well and function well instead of who's right, who's wrong, all the emotional attachment that comes with that. Hey, FFPs, we've been talking to you for a few weeks now about Cozy and you know, things are changing. We're starting to emerge. Things are getting busy again and calendars are filling up. So there's never really a better time for us to get to chat with you about this amazing app because it's the number one organizing app out there and was even called the most must have app for a better life by the Today Show. You can juggle school schedules, practices, meetings, doctor's appointments, you name it, even your workout or your date night. Yep. And the best part is it's totally free. It's called Cozy, C-O-Z-I. You can download it from your app store today. Totally free. It tracks everyone's schedules and events in one place with a shared color-coded calendar. I love that part. And it reminds you about those events so you don't have to remember it. The amount of brain space that I used to use just trying to juggle our schedules is now free to focus on other things. So it's super easy to get started. You can even pull in events from your family's personal work and school calendars, and you can download it from that app store. So go check it out, Cozy, C-O-Z-I, and get the free app today. I think that's well said as well, because the this is highly charged. I think parenting feels very vulnerable mm -hmm. because we do feel like whether we admit this 
overtly or not, we do feel that our kids are sort of a product of us and they're walking around as little examples of how we're doing. And so if there's a, there's a piece of vulnerability there, but when we take out the attacks and the, you're doing it wrong and can just say, Hey, let's take a look. Let's take an objective look at what's going well and what isn't. What's cool about this too, is sometimes if something isn't going well and you bring it to the other parent, they might have an idea you hadn't even considered. Mm -hmm. And this, this happens to me all the time. And it happens to me in my home, in my blended family, but also across households. Sometimes, sometimes my ex-husband has an idea for an approach and I'm like, oh, that's actually, we should try that. And I love that because it, again, it takes away any kind of attack kind of mentality. It's like, I'm not against you. I just, we're kind of stuck here. What can we do? And letting everyone bring something to the table really helps. That being said, because I'm real and I am in a two household family, I, I want to give a couple tips for that. If I can one, just being that again, the communication is still really important. You've got to be having chats about the co-parenting piece. And if you come to a place in this conversation where, you know, we're just not, we can't get to where we, we match that has to be communicated to the children. Now I would say that's also true in an intact home. If there's going to be some things that look slightly different parent to parent, your kids should know that because they deserve to know what to expect and not be confused. Like, wait, mom usually does it like this, but dad's over here doing that. I'm, I'm confused. You know, they deserve to not be confused, but especially in a two household dynamic, it becomes extra important to sit the kids down and be able to share with them. Here's what you can expect at my house. And here's how that might look different over here. And I think if both parents can do that together, it's really helpful. At least it's, it doesn't make it any easier for them. They're having to adapt with those differences as they switch house to house, but at least they know what to expect. And I think the unknown is way worse to, to go like, wait, this is different. And I didn't know it was going to be mm-hmm. at least if you go over and you're like, oh, I knew this was going to be like this here. I'm going to work to adapt. That's really helpful. So communication, not only with each other, which I mentioned at the top of the episode, but I think there is an element here of communicating to the children. And I think that becomes particularly important in a two household dynamic. Yeah, definitely. And I think too, like with that, if you decide you want to parent in a particular way, as long as you're not undermining your partner or the other household, right? then it's okay for you to go down that path, right? There's no reason why, just to take an example we use all the time, if your partner doesn't want to get down to your child's level in aisle nine of the grocery store because they're having a tantrum, that doesn't mean you can't. That doesn't undermine your partner unless your partner has explicitly stated that for whatever reason, they're against that. That's a different conversation. But if they just don't have the tools or don't feel like that matters or whatever it is, it doesn't stop you from doing it. You're not undermining your partner. And that's totally totally worth looking at is what choices can I make that don't undermine that allow me to still parent the way that I want to parent? And how can I do it in a way that is supportive of my partner, but also allows me to lean into the spots that maybe don't feel full yet? Does that make sense? Yeah. I think another practical example where that's really doable is with screen time. Some parents just, it's, it's too hard to even have what they would consider a battle, but maybe one parent feels really strongly about like, we don't do screens at the table or there's a time limit in the day. Well, then let that parent enforce that. That's actually not bad. And it's not saying that the way the other parent is doing it is wrong. It's just, Hey, this happens to be important to me. So I'll put those systems in place and, and help make sure they happen. Now that has to go the other way though, too. So what it means is if the other parent doesn't have the bandwidth for that, that's fine. They don't have to implement those things, but they do need to support them. If you've put them in place, there's, it's really important not to be kind of digging out from each under each other. I mean, that's really what you're talking about, right? You can't, if, if a parent feels strongly about something and the other parent is like, totally fine, you can set that up. You can be the one to enforce it. They can't come behind and around and undo it. Well, and I love that you said that because the flip of that is if it's really important to your partner that X, Y, and Z happens, they shouldn't be expecting you to be the one to enforce that. That's important Mm -hmm. too. I see that Mm -hmm. a lot actually, where one, one partner really wants like stronger discipline and they put it over to the other partner 
who yeah. actually isn't all about the discipline and go, yeah. you need to handle that. Well, that's not reasonable. So for both of you, if there's something of yours that you're really passionate about and your partner's not on board with it, you can't say you have to handle this. It's okay for you to say, okay, I understand that's not as important to you. I'll take on that responsibility and vice versa. If your partner is saying, no, 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 we can't do it that way because I want to make sure we do it this way. You can say, okay, well, I'm not comfortable enforcing that. So if you're comfortable, you know, if you want that and it matters to you, you need to be the one in charge of that. Yes. Yep. It's both sides of the coin. If you, you can't ask for what you're not also willing to give your partner. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you for that question. And we always appreciate when we're invited to think maybe more deeply or slightly differently about a topic we've presented previously. So we hope that was helpful in just giving at least a few ideas that kind of scratch the surface of what do you do when you, when you don't match on this stuff that, cause that can be really challenging and we recognize that. And so just to kind of hit some of those reminders again, just so you have some takeaways from this first and foremost, get the foundation of the tools for becoming united. So you can get that by opening up those lines of communication, making sure that you're meeting together, making sure that you aren't undermining each other. Maybe check out that episode on parental unity that we did a few seasons back, just come so that you're coming to the table with the tools. Another really important thing is that you're not undermining each other. So that means if somebody says something, even if you don't love it, try to back that person. Taking that further, as Kira just described, is if there's a partner who feels strongly about something, we make sure that that is siloed with the person it matters most to. So a couple ways that's fleshed out. The first being, if it's really important to someone, we put the onus on them. Let them be in charge of that piece, whether that's screen time or whether that's discipline, let them carry that out if it's what's really important. But at the same time, it means that we are not doing the opposite and saying, oh, well, this is really important to me, but I'm handing it to you to implement. (laughs) We've got to be cautious about that. And I think another really important piece that we mentioned is communication, not just with each other, but with the children, especially if there are going to be changes. It's important that they have that heads up and know what to expect, especially if you're in a a two household family. And then let's also just shatter the assumption that just because you disagree, it means you can't get on the same page with the proper communication and with understanding and digging in as you talk, you really can work to find where that common ground is. And that includes things like getting clear on why that person feels strongly about this issue. It might be their own childhood, things that happen there. It could be family of origin issues, but finding that out might really help you understand, oh, well, that's why that's so important to you. You know what? I can actually get on board with that. So let's not assume that what looks like a disagreement on the outside can't lead to unity and to a place that leads to some great future focused parenting where you're both doing it in a way that can help you both be comfortable. We just want to encourage all of you to be working toward that all the time. I mean, that's a huge thing. It's why we did an episode on unity so early on in the podcast. So thank you so much for being with us today. As you know, you're the reason we're still here. So if you haven't yet and you're interested in becoming a future focused patron, it is only $5 a month. So literally a coffee a month and you can help us keep bringing you this content. Simply go to patreon.com slash FFP, or you can also find it through our website, futurefocusedparenting.com and just click membership and all the information will be there. Another great way you can help us out is if you're part of a mom's group, a co-op preschool, if you're part of a company that brings in parent education, we love speaking at events and we can even do that virtually. So please reach out if that would be of interest. The way you can find out more about that is also on our website, futurefocusedparenting.com and just click speaking and you'll learn all about what it takes to hire us to come share with your group. In the meantime, we hope you have a wonderful week and we look forward to being back with you next time. Raising Adults is produced by Kira Dorian and Dina Thayer and recorded partially in Kira's laundry room, partially in my cozy coat closet. Editing by Allison Preisinger, music by Seattle band Hannah Lee. Thanks for listening.